Uh, turn with me to 1 John. 1 John. I want to talk to you tonight about growing Christians. Okay? Growing Christians. I hope you understand that not every Christian is growing. Okay? And again, we're not talking about weight. <laughs> I've got that part down, all right? But we're talking about spiritually growing. And the thing we as uh, Christians that have been that way a long time, uh, I think sometimes we could put on the coasters, okay, to where we're kind of coasting or, you know, we may not be in a backslidden condition, but folks, here's the deal. We never arrive spiritually. We could never say, uh, you know, I've done everything that God has asked me to do. Because uh, there's, to me, there's always something God has for us. And I just, you know, want you to understand how important it is uh, to grow as a Christian. Uh, there's outlines back there if you want to get one or if you have gotten one. Uh, let me give you the outline. Growing Christians, number one, growing Christians try to avoid sin. Try to avoid sin. And I struggled with the word try. And the reason I settled in on try, and, and I almost started, I almost put these words in there, try very hard to avoid sin, okay? Because uh, again, you're, we're not perfect. We'll never be perfect. Uh, we have failures in our lives. Uh, there is no man born of a woman. Uh, we, you know, we, we were born into sin, Psalms 51, uh, 5 tells us. Uh, so, uh, growing Christians try to avoid sin. Number two, growing Christians keep God's commandments. And we're not talking about just the Ten Commandments, okay? The commandments are not just the laws of God. The commandments is the Bible. And there's not one of us that keep every word in the Bible and do everything the Bible tells us to do. But again, these need to be goals in our life. And even with the perfection... We will not reach perfection while we're here on earth because of our human nature, but we still should strive for perfection. And uh, Jesus is our example there. Number three, live in the light. Okay, if you're going to grow, you've got to stay in the light. And we even know uh, from nature, from the sun, that things thrive in light. Th things die, all right, in darkness. And so that is very, very important. You know, the books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John speaks of how you truly know if you have been saved or born again. Another important issue John covers is how a true Christian deals with sin. He uses the contrast between light and darkness to support this issue. The Bible tells us God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. Satan is represented by darkness. Every person that has been born has to deal with this issue in their lives. Anyone can say they are a Christian. Anyone can talk the talk. But 1 John reveals the difference between a true believer and a non-believer. Let's look at the difference John points out in Scripture. John, 1 John uh, chapter 2, verse 1. The Bible says, my little children, that alone tells you something, okay? These are uh, new converts, uh, some of them are. These are people that have not matured in Christ. And again, he's writing to the church at Ephesus here. These things I write to you so that so you may not sin. He's reminding us that sin is out there. He is reminding us that temptation is real. He's reminding us that we have to be on our guard, okay? We can't let our guard down. We can't take days off as Christians. It's just like even on vacation, all right? You know, when am I not a, when I'm, when am, when am I not a pastor? Do I ever just take off the pastor role and say, I'm not a pastor today? Now, some people, when they see me riding my motorcycle and I got a Harley and I'm going down the road, you know, some people think, that guy's a pastor? But folks, I'm just telling you, we always have to understand that people are watching us they're wa and they're listening to our words, actions and words. And so we need to guard this at all times. Uh, 
And if anyone sins, we have an advocate. And I love that word advocate. It's, it is someone that speaks for us. All right. I've heard a lot of people say when I stand before God, you know, I, I hope I don't choke. I hope I know what to say to him. And folks, I'm just telling you, in my estimation of scripture, Jesus Christ is our advocate. He's going to say he's one of mine, okay? And, and to have Jesus on our side, it doesn't mean that we won't sin, okay? This is the point that he's getting. It's just that if we slip, if we fall, there is something we can do as Christians. An advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Folks, Jesus lived here 33 years and he never sinned. I've witnessed to people that called my hand on that. And I'm just saying, you know, if you don't think that's true, then you have not read the Bible or you do not believe the Bible. But folks, I believe the Bible. I believe every word of the Bible. And I believe with all my heart, Jesus did not sin. He was the perfect lamb of God. Righteousness was all over him. And he, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And propitiation basically means a payment. His life, his blood, his body was broken. His blood was spilled on Calvary. He died for you and I. And 2 Corinthians 5 even says, all right, he became sin for us. All right, he, it was his payment and his perfect life and his death and his resurrection. That's, that's what propitiation means. He paid our debt. And it was a debt that we, you can never repay. You cannot pray enough, go to church enough, give enough to pay for your salvation. Jesus Christ did that for us. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. And again, I don't want to get in some, you know, uh, you know uh, thoughts, uh, but basically there are people that believe that Christ died only for those who are going to be saved. And I totally disagree with that thought. Okay, Jesus Christ died for everyone. Look at 1 John chapter 3. 1 John 3. And we're going to be working all through 1 John. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him there is no sin. When you were saved... All right, Jesus Christ, and I, I use this example a lot. Uh, if we had a big racer board, or if we had a big board back here, just with every sin that I ever committed before I got saved, he took the racer and he erased every one of our sins. Now, here's the key in salvation and in the key of, uh, you know, uh, uh, asking for forgiveness of your sins. Folks, the key there is repentance. All right? We can't just say this easy believism. Okay? If I pray a prayer, if I pray the sinner's prayer, then I'm saved. Okay? The two keys in both salvation and being right with God is repentance. It's God, I'm sorry. It's God, I am wrong. God, will you please forgive me? Verse 6, whoever abides in him does not sin. Now that almost seems like it contradicts what I've said earlier about, you know, you know, everybody sins. It doesn't mean when you get saved, you never sin again, because we know that. We are living testimonies that that's not the truth. All right? The truth is we don't want to sin. We try not to sin. We do everything we can. And, and the bottom line is sin is not our lifestyle, okay? And folks, conviction of the Holy Spirit should do that. Conviction of the Holy Spirit should convict us to where we do feel bad. We want to repent. We want to be right with God. Not that we're perfect because we're not. Verse 6, whoever abides in him does not sin, and whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. And again, this, this really is in some 
people's book, controversial scripture, but I don't believe it is. It basically, I believe it's saying they don't have a lifestyle of sin. Because I've even heard people say, you know, they were gonna they had premeditated and said, I know it's wrong, but I'm gonna do it anyway. And the question is, are they saved or are they not saved? Well, folks. The only people that know that is God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit in that person. Okay, if I go in flippantly saying the reason I can get away with this is because later on I can just ask for forgiveness of sin and everything will be fine. Well, folks, there's penalty for sin. Okay, when we, I mean, if you truly are a child of God, he is going to punish you. He's going to discipline you for that sin. It doesn't mean we won't sin. It simply means that repentance needs to be in our lives, and we can't live in that sin. It bothers us. It troubles us. We lose sleep over it. We are are disturbed. We are hurt sometimes even by that. Verse 7 Again, little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness just as he is righteous. Here's the key right here, okay? And it says, he who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. And he's calling a cat a cat and a dog a dog. He's saying, if you live in sin, you are probably not saved. If sin doesn't bother you, you are probably not saved. You live in unrighteousness. But he says, if righteous people do righteous things, he who sin for this purpose, the son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. And I've even heard Christians say that, well, I can't help but sin. And I'm just like, yes, you can. Okay. You don't have to sin. And here's the deal. It's a choice. Every time you are confronted with sin, you have to make a decision. Am I going to sin or am I not going to sin? And the key again is the Holy Spirit. The key again is walking in righteousness. The key again is is, uh, being at one with Jesus Christ. Folks, that's how he lived a perfect life. Him and his father was always one. Jesus was always communicating with God. Jesus was always obeying God. And again, we'll not reach that perfection, but I'm just saying, you know, an apple's an apple, an orange is an orange, and and, and sin is sin, and wrong is wrong, and right is right. And it says, whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Matthew teaches us of false professions of faith, all right? There are many, uh, you know, as far as uh, the gate, Matthew chapter 7, broad is the gate that leads to destruction, narrow is the, the gate that leads to life. Why do you build broad gates? Because there's a lot of folks going, folks. They're going in the wrong direction. And narrow is the way. And then later on he says, and and I believe this is one of the saddest verses in the Bible, people going through life thinking they were saved or acting like they were saved, but they did not have a true true change of heart. It doesn't mean they did not sin, okay? It simply means that they did not, you know, as far as repentance, they were not truly saved. And, And he simply says, you know, I never knew you. And we'll be talking about uh, that a little bit later on. Now look at 1 John 1, chapter 1. That's kind of the negative part of this. And here's what I think is the positive part. Verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Folks, everybody has sin. I mean, he that knoweth that doeth good and doeth it not, James says it is sin. There are so many ways we sin. We sin in our mind. We sin in our bodies. Uh, we sin, in, you know, in you know, in choices that we make. We sin, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the key there is confessing our sins. And folks, I've said this. 
I don't know how many times since I've been pastor here for 20 years. Every night, every night, every night when I go to bed, I ask myself three questions. Number one, am I right with God? Number two, am I right with my family? Number three, am I right with my fellow man? And if I, can, if I cannot say yes, yes, and yes, it's time to do some confessing, and it's time to do some repenting. And you know what I found, about, found out about that? God's never lied to me, and God even points out things I may not have thought it was sin, but when I start getting serious with God, I realize, you know, I probably didn't have the right attitude about that. I probably didn't say the right thing about it. Right, right thing at that time, okay? And, and that's where confession, confession is more than just getting caught. See, some people won't confess till they get caught. When we sin, if we are truly Christians, we should be convicted of the Holy Spirit, but God gives us a way to be right with God. We have to confess our sins and repent of our sins, and I love this, and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. I have yet to meet the person that says they are perfect. I have yet to meet the person that said they have never sinned. But the key again, we, if we're going to grow as Christians, we need to try our best to avoid sin. And when we fall into sin, we need to confess and, and repent and be right with the Lord. Number two, growing Christians keep God's commandment. Look at verse three. And by this we know that we know him. And folks, know is so important. You know, I, I just, in my spirit and in my heart, when I hear somebody say, I ask them, if you were to die today, would, are you going to go to heaven? And you know what I get about half of the time? I hope so. And I'm like, are you going to live your whole life on I hope so? Are you going to put eternity on I hope so? Folks, when I got saved, I knew so. When I was five, I just canceled the five. When I was five years old, and, and y'all know my testimony. I mean, this preacher literally scared me to death. And I'll never forget what he said to this day. He said, if you don't want to go to hell, you get up here. And that's exactly what I did. I was five years old, and I thought, well, I don't want to go to hell. But I don't remember anybody counseling me. I don't re remember anything that. I thought the coolest thing was we had them old Polaroid pictures where they come out at the front of the camera, and they'd put them on the board. I thought that was the coolest thing about all that. And then when I was 14, I was called. But I'm telling you, I, was, I, I came on my terms. I said, God, I'll give you this but don't, I can't do this. I, I can't go all in on all this. And I was still living my own life doing what I wanted to do. But when I was 22 years old, folks, God changed my life. It was totally different. And I will say this, and, and I always get kicked back. It, the bigger the audience, the more likely I get a kickback. I said, and I'll say it today, ever since I was 22 years old, I've never doubted my salvation. Never have. Okay, and I know not everybody, I know people struggle with that, all right? But I have, because I know that I'm saved. If we keep his commandments, he who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. <laughs> have you noticed John is pretty matter of fact about things? That's twice already in scripture we've seen where he just says, you're a liar, okay? All right, if you don't keep his commandments, you're lying. Okay, you're lying to God, and here's what the bad part is, you're lying to yourself. And why do we lie to ourselves? Because we don't want to fess up, all right? I mean, I, I can tell you right now, I feel like Paul was. I, 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 at one time in my life, was the chiefest of sinners. I know what his resume was before he got saved. And, and I think in my life, I, I, you know, I never killed anyone. I never had anybody put to death. But, you know, my life, I'm just telling you, I live for myself and I live for fun. And God changed my heart. He changed it. He is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. Folks, that's, that's what he's saying. Perfection we will never get while we're here, but we ought to be closer to Christ 
today than we were yesterday. A month ago, a year ago, 10 years ago, we should be closer to Christ. That's what he is saying, all right? And it says he's perfected this in us. And by this, we know we are in him. And he who says he abides in him ought himself to walk just as he walks. I've said this a thousand times. If, if you want to know what to do, simply ask yourself any question, any question, what would Jesus do? What would he do? Now, again, I would have loved to have been there and walked in Peter's steps, or I'd love to have been one of the disciples. And, you know, I, I was discipled by Jesus himself. But we aren't. But you know what we do have? We've got the Word of God. We've got God's holy Word to lead us and to guide us. So in some ways, we can walk where He walks. And we ought to always, 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 okay, what would Jesus do? 1 John 3, 1 John 3, 18. My little children, <laughs> that's the third time he has said this, all right? He's growing up baby Christians. He's helping uh, disciple. He's helping mature, uh, you, know, ma you know, immature uh, uh, Christians. He's trying to help them. Let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed in, and in truth. Folks, anybody can say that they're a Christian. Anybody can give a testimony. But folks, our life, our deeds, our actions, what we say, where we go, how we react ought to reflect the love of Jesus Christ that's in our life. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. And folks, God knows. Uh, and, and that's why I truly believe God you know, when, when he canonized Scripture, when he chose specifically who he was going to talk to and what was going to be said in the stories that we heard, you remember stories. And this is why, uh, you know, to me, we have a lot of hope. All right? Think of somebody in the Old Testament. Think, think of Jonah. What was he doing? It, I mean, he was running from God. But yet God used him to, to, to see a revival done, even though Jonah was not right with God. Think of Peter. Peter was the spokesperson. All right, Peter was you know, one of the three, the inner three. And even Jesus told him, you're going to deny me three times. What did Peter say? No, I'm not. But he did. Okay, he denied Christ. So this, to me, gives us hope. All right, I may, what, it, what it's saying is, I may mess up, okay, but God is greater, okay? Philippians 4.13, what? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I'm telling you, uh, I want to use, it just popped into my head, addiction. I may tell you what, folks, our world is full of addiction. Pornography, we can just go down the list. Alcohol, drugs, you know, sex, all these things. And I am telling you, we can overcome those things with God's help. God is greater. And it says, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. And whatever we ask, we receive of Him because we keep his commandments. He's given you two keys there. One is prayer. We must be prayer warriors. We, not, we must wake up. I've always said uh, a, a true Christian needs to pray five times a day. Five times a day. You need to start your day in, in prayer. You need to bless all three meals. And even if you're fasting, you should spend time in prayer. Okay, and then the last prayer is the most important prayer of the day. It's confession. Okay, it's confession time with God. And not only prayer, keeping his commandments. 
Folks, we know right from wrong. We just sometimes choose wrong, or we get lazy spiritually, or we take days off, or, or even we compare. We should not compare ourselves to, I mean, I've even heard people say, well, I'm not as bad as that guy. Well, folks, that doesn't matter what that guy is doing. What matters is where's my walk? Where am I with Jesus Christ? All right? And it says, uh, because we keep his commandments and do those things which are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of the Son of Jesus Christ and love one another as he has given us commandment. So when we look at the scripture here, it's just basically saying another time, we need to be like Jesus. 1 John 1, 1, that which was from the beginning, which we heard and which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. Folks, Jesus himself said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And it says, in the life that was manifested, we have seen and we bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father, was manifested to us. That which you have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you may also have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father, with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. And folks, we can't say, or we shouldn't say as Christians, well, you know, I, I, I haven't been with Jesus Christ. I wish I'd have been with Jesus Christ. I wish I would, could have seen his. Well, what's the key there, folks? The key is faith. You got to have faith to grow in the Lord. You got to have faith to stay close to the Lord. You have to have faith, all right? Uh, and, and even it says to move mountains, prayer. Praying in faith, and all that is important. And I love the last, the, last, the last phrase in that. I write to you that your joy may be full. You, you show me a Christian that's right with God, and I'll show you a Christian that lives in joy. All right? There's a term today I called one of our shut-ins today, and I said, how you doing? And they said, I won't say male or female, oh, I'm treading water. Because I say that every now and then, and, and he was gig. Oh, he! I gave it away. He was gigging me. He he was he was just saying, "Oh, I'm just treading water." Folks, that is not the abundant life. The abundant life is being right with God. The abundant life is being right with your family. The abundant life is being right with your fellow man. And folks, Jesus is our example. They got to see John in this opening paragraph is simply saying. I saw what Jesus did. I was with him when he did the miracles. I have been able to write part of the Bible. And he is testifying, saying, everything that is said about Jesus is true. And you know what I would say? True and even better than that. That's what abundant life is, folks. So, growing Christians try to avoid sin, keeps God's commandments, and lives in the light. Brethren, I write to you no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you've heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. And again, a new commandment I write to you which is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. There's two thoughts here. One, the Old Testament and the New Testament. All right, what did the Old Testament talk about? An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You know, some of that there, you know. And, and what does the New Testament say? Uh, look at uh, John chapter 13. Go with me to John 13. John 13, verse 34. Jesus' words. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And I love verse 35. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Folks, I believe the thing that sets Christianity, Christianity apart from other religions is love. 
1 John also three times in 1 John chapter 4 says, God is love. And when we live in the light, we are showing God's love. Folks, there's so much hate today. It's just pitiful how ugly and, you know, there's all kinds of shootings and, you know, they're, they're just situations and lives and families and hatred and animosity and people not speaking to one another. And I've learned a long time ago, folks, we should not say this to anyone, anyone, I hate you. We shouldn't. Where is the love of Christ in that? Where is the love? I mean, Jesus dying on the cross did nothing wrong, was nailed to a cross, was beaten, uh, you know, within an inch of his life. Still said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And folks, God is love. The old commandment, uh, Cain and Abel, was a perfect picture of that. Okay? I mean, Cain didn't bring, you know, true reverence. Cain didn't bring, uh, you, know, the, you know, the sacrifice that was pleasing to God. And he killed the first murder. He killed his own brother. Okay. And you folks, you have to hate someone. I, I, I still, I, I can't fathom taking a person's life. Okay. It, it's just, you are not living in life. You are living in darkness uh, if you do those things. Now look at the rest of this. And it says the true light in verse eight is shining. Uh, folks, Jesus was the epitome of loved. He, is, he was love. You know, he did his miracles. He wasn't doing miracles to show off, folks. He was doing miracles to authenticate who he was. But he met a human need, and he always made a spiritual application to the miracles that he did. And we need to do the same in our life. Look at verse 9. And he who says he is in light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there's no cause for stumbling. It's not that you won't stumble, but if you live in the light, I mean, you know, it's kind of like when you uh, go to a place or you go to a motel room, and you get up in the middle of the night, and you have no clue where everything is. Now, in my house, I'm telling you, I can tell you how many steps it is to my bathroom in the pitch dark, and I can walk in there in the pitch dark. Why? because I've done it over and over and over again. But you know the key? Psst, turn that light on. Turn the light on, folks, and you will see clearly Jesus is the light. But he who hates his brothers in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. 1 John 1.5 1 John 1.5 This is the message which you have heard from him and declare to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Folks, we won't be stumbling around the uh, you know, dark if we walk with Jesus, if we talk with Jesus, if we listen to his words, if we worship Jesus. And it says, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Man, I'm just telling you, John was calling everybody a liar, all right? He was just saying, why do we lie to ourselves, okay? You should not hate your brother. You should not hate anyone. Now, you need, you need to hate sin, okay? But Jesus has said, hate the sin, but love the sinner. I mean, he hung out with tax collectors, prostitutes. He, you know, again, he, he, he looked past. He looked to their potential. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Now, 1 John 3, last one. 1 John 3, verse 10. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor, nor does he not love his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. 
And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brother's righteousness. And you know why we hate people a lot of the times? Sometimes it's because they have something that we want or something that we don't have or something that we envy or something that, you know, maybe, you know, you know in our eyes they took from us. All right. And this saying is, we were kids, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Folks, there are words that really hurt folks. I, I can look at a person's face and tell you when words hurt them. And we, those things do not need to come out of our mouths. And, and again, I'm all for telling the truth. First Peter chapter 2, but the Bible says, tell the truth in love. Tell it in love. And, and it says, uh, do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you, we know that it, we have passed from life to death because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. And whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. As we close tonight, I just want to admonish you, do your best, try your best to avoid sin. You want to grow in the Lord. You want a spirit-filled life. You want to feel that abundant life and that joy that comes from. Avoid sin. Avoid sin at all costs. Keep God's commandments. Man, his word was written for us. It's God's instructions. And number three, and this is so important, God is light. Jesus is the light of the world, and we need to live in light. Father, thank you for this day. And God, I thank you for John. And Lord, I know, you know, it, it's kind of like James. The book of James is this way too. Man, they cut to the chase. He just says, you know, right is right and wrong is wrong. And we need to do the right thing. And God, I pray that everyone here, whether they're here in person or listening to us uh, on, on live stream, God, I pray that we would truly look at our own life. And God, I pray that we would do our best to get as far away from sin as we can. And God, I pray that we would not only read God's Word, but we would obey God's Word. I pray that we would desire to keep God's Word in every area of our lives. And God, the key truly is living in the light. You are the light. Even Matthew 5 tells us we are the light of the world, a city that's on a hill that cannot be hidden. God, I pray this week we will let our light shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. God, we need light to grow as Christians. And God, I pray that we will live in that light. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.